Welcome to another episode of the Match Lip Podcast. My name is Frank Angeloni. I am your host. And on today's show, we're going to be interviewing Matt from Bill and Ogres. But before we get to that, if you haven't checked out our previous episode with Warp Storm Games out in Wisconsin with store owner Antonio, he's one of five owners of the store, one of the co-owners there. I highly suggest you go and check that out and then come back and listen to my episode here with Matt of Bill and Ogres. And I want to bring Matt into the show here today. And um, I'm very glad to have him. Matt, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Uh, I go by Ogre. Feel free to call me anything. Uh, Ogre would be preferred. Um, okay. Doing good. And how did the, the nickname come to be? Uh, I was at my local game store in St. Louis a long, long time ago, probably 25-ish years ago, and a friend of mine uh, decided, he's like, I think I want to call you Ogre. And I just said, uh, okay, that sounds cool. And then I ran with it for the last 25 years, uh, so there are people all over the country and world that, that know me as, as Ogre. So by calling me Matt, nobody will know who you're talking about. But if they <laughs> if they hear, oh, Ogre was on a podcast, uh, then they that you might get more views. It's a brain recognition thing at this point. Yeah. So how long have you guys been running the store? I know you have a business partner with the store. So yeah, my business partner is Travis Gibson or William Gibson. Um, the store has been open for six years or a little little under six years because it was a secondary part of what our actual business is. Okay. And how did the store come to be? How did it all get started? So one day, um, uh, one of our employees at the time, his name is Eric Brooks, said, this community really needs a storefront. And uh, what we really are is a high-velocity bulk traders. So we buy and sell large collections or incredibly large amounts of cards. So, for instance, right now we're trying to sell 12 million Magic cards. Um, we also sell 2 to 5 million Pokemon cards every month um, and anything else we can get our hands on. But we had our warehouse, and we were buying and uh, processing cards there. And Eric, who was... A uh, great employee, and he's like, "I want to, I want to run the store." And we're like, "All right, well, we're n we don't really want to open one, but if you run it, we'll open it." And he said, "All right, cool." So, about you know, we already had the building that we were renting out uh, where we are from our landlord ready, so we're like, "All right, well, you just use this one," and we let him run it. And three months down the road, he's like, "Hey, I got a better job, so I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to go." So that is the infancy of the storefront. And how did buying so much product come about? What was the um, reasoning for starting in that direction? So that direction is interesting. So the, um, as far as bulk goes, um, I, it's like the foot in the door. So if you're gonna go buy cards from somewhere, you might as well start off with something they basically don't want. So. I would approach stores and I would be like, hey, um, I buy bulk. And they're like, oh, great. We got a, a back room full of it. I'm like, okay. And then I'd offer money and they'd take it. And then I would try to you know, see where I could go from there as far as if they uh, wanted to sell any other products. Very interesting. And, and where are you guys currently located? Uh, currently, it's Murphy, North Carolina, um, which is the most western part of North Carolina. So we, are, we do not get to see the ocean every day. And is this your only location? Have you been elsewhere prior to this location? Uh, we've had a few warehouses and other spots as far as me and Travis uh, goes. Um, I owned a, a few different stores throughout my life. Um, there's one in St. Louis called Rivals a long, long time ago. I forget what date. Um, after that, there was one called Ogre's, Car or Ogre's Games. Um, then I sold that. It became Ivory Tower. And then they closed. And then I reopened it as a and gave it to my girlfriend. Uh, that one was called Rarity. Um, and then that closed because I wasn't in town at the time. And then then Just Games was uh, was a store that was across from Troll and Toad. I used to be the head pricer for Troll and Toad for three years, around 2009. And yeah, that's the lineage of storefronts for me. So you've been at this for quite some time then. And you mentioned Troll and Toad. And you know, with the news that recently came out with Troll and Toad. Kind of, what a perfect transition, right? <laughs> right. Um, I'm curious what your whole take is on that, just from somebody who used to work for Troll and Toad and now like being a, in the background, you know, see, having your own separate store, now seeing that transpire, what your thoughts are on that and how that affects what your store may have to adjust to in terms of magic product, for example. Sure. It doesn't mean, uh, so Troll and Toad was recently bought by a guy named Ben. Um, from John Houston a few years ago. And Ben, from my experience, uh, is more of a Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon person. 
Um, so when, whenever you buy companies, you try to figure out what makes most sense for that company to do better. And I believe that that's what um, he is doing. He's just picking the things that makes the most sense for him and moving forward. I do not think that it is, uh, oh my God, the sky is falling, even though everybody can kind of see that part of the, the community, at least if you're a vendor or if you're a store owner, you can kind of see there have been multiple brand new products that come out of the gates and either Amazon selling them you know, way beforehand for less money than we can buy them wholesale or or they're just they just don't sell on TCG player for more than we buy them for. So that's just something you need to just be aware of when opening as a storefront. And what would you say then is at this point in time for Bill and Ogres the the most difficult challenge you feel currently facing the game store? The game store itself, our storefront, is about eight percent of our business. Um so that part is running fairly well. It's it's running um, good based on what we expect it to. Um, the the wholesale side of things, which is what our the majority of our business is, uh, has certainly seen a dip as far as how strong all three Magic Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon games are. Uh, those are the three major ones we deal with. Um, as far as other people buying them to then re- resell them, which is what we basically do. We buy stuff to sell it to other people that sell it to other people, but on a much larger scale than your regular game store. And with, you know, from the flip side of things, based on that, what would you say is a positive that you feel is coming out of the store these days? Um, I mean, the more the more energy you put into it, the, the more community you get. And it's really nice to go in somewhere where there's like a bunch of people that really enjoy being there and enjoy it when you walk in and say hi. Like that's, that's the, the positive. On top of, you know, like the storefront's doing okay. So there's a little bit of money for sure. But uh, the community is probably the most important thing for a brick and mortar storefront, in my opinion, uh, to to keep it growing and to keep it uh, above water. And what are some of the things you and Travis are doing to to grow the store in terms of the player base? Uh, Just continually being as, uh, I don't know, get the product that they want. Uh, as for all businesses, um, finding the products that the people want to buy from you are, are important. Like, uh, for instance, we dabbled into Loricana, which, you know, is very limited right now, but they wanted it. So we got it and it gobbled up. Um, One Piece just came out or has been out for a little while. And we just started uh, getting into that. And as soon as we got the product in, the product sold out. Um So just finding and making sure that you're catering to what the needs are of the, the people that are providing you with their uh, hard-earned money. so Which of those games, in terms of events held, would you say is the most popular among your player base? Um, Magic is the most popular, um, mostly because both my and Travis's like, past are, are heavily involved in Magic, um, so we know more about it. Um, the most exciting right now is, is Lorcana, um, because it's just the new, new kid on the block, basically. Uh, and it's a great game. As far as I, I've played it, and I don't really play that many games, but it, it was a uh, pretty fun to play. And you mentioned that you and Travis both have a past in Magic. Does that involve like competitive play? Is that what drew you into the business? Um, no. Um, so we both have a past in Magic. Uh, he has been in the industry since he could get a job as an adult. Basically, um, he worked for Star City and Channel Fireball for most of his career. Um, and but what got me into magic is when I started playing in high school, um, the uh, the IT professional that was working there, his son was also in it, like went to school with me as well, and they played. And he said, you know, if I could get a time walk, I, I would really like to get one of those. And I said, well, let me see if I can't find one for you. So I found one. He told me how much he wanted to pay at the time. It was like fifty dollars. So I found one that I could pay twenty five for. And I then sold it to him for 50 bucks. And in high school, that extra $25 felt like a lot of money. So I then just started doing that as much as I possibly could. And so that, would you say that was the turning point that made you envision running a store as a possibility? The, just the idea of flipping like that? So I wouldn't think, at, at that moment, I wasn't thinking, oh, man, I could run a store. I was thinking, oh, man, I could hustle some cards and, you know, make some some money over the summer. But what really got me into it is, let's fast forward, I don't know, another 
seven or eight years from that time, I've opened and closed a few stores, but the, the store that I really liked running, um, which was Ogre's Games, uh, my girlfriend at the time asked me if I could get some of the magic cards out of my bathroom because I was storing them there. And I felt like that was a reasonable request. So I went and found a location to open. As far as business in general, uh, that moment with the, uh, the time walk, that was the, definitely the spark. If you were to say, like, if you're, you know, a spark for the planeswalker, that was my planeswalker spark as to, oh, I can make money doing this. That sounds awesome. Very cool. And when you look at your player base today, how many, what would you give like the ratio in terms of like returning players versus new players that come in? Are you seeing like steady new players come in as well as the continuing, um, influx of the the players that are already used to your store um most all right one we live in the middle of murphy north carolina which is there's no other store in about an hour in every direction of us um so it's really an anomaly as far as to get new players you have to really be aggressive and i think this kind of counts for most stores you have to go out of your way to to acquire new new players so we did get you know we slowly get new players that naturally come in but for the most part we have to grow them (laughs) And you said um, Murphy, North Carolina. In for somebody like myself that I'm from New York, how would you um, geographically like to the closest major city? Place it. Um, four hour, four to oh, oh, it's two and a half hours north of Atlanta. Oh, okay. So you're actually closer to, I guess, Atlanta than Durham, for example. I don't know where that is, but yeah, probably. Okay. Um. And what has been, would you say, um, your favorite thing these days about, you know, going to the store every day? Because as, you know, I've talked to other stores and we know that, you know, the, the grind that it is and the, the low margins that, that come with uh, running a game store. So what has been your motivating factor of continuing this, having had other stores in the past? So unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't actually go to the store every day. I have a manager. Um and an employee that that take care of that 98% of the time. Um, I only have to go if there's something wrong or if there's some huge buy that's going to happen. Like tomorrow or Wednesday. Wednesday, there's going to be a buy that's going to be anywhere in between like $10,000 and $20,000. And then I'll probably go there to oversee that. But for the most part, I'm out traveling, um, trying to find bigger purchases and sales that I can make so that we can make the whole company bigger. What do your travels consist of? Are you doing like conventions? Uh, so I don't sign up for conventions. I go to them though. Um, I go to them to just talk to all the other people in the industry. Um, and every time that I've gone, I've lined up some other fairly large deal, say in between five and six figures, almost every time that I've gone to any show. Um, and I go to the shows, uh, either I'm traveling around the country, mostly in the Midwest, um, to pick up either bulk Pokemon or just a collection here or there almost every week. Um, And if there's a show that makes sense to go to, then I'll just go to that instead as well along my route. So it'll be like Murphy, North Carolina to Kansas city to Chicago or to green Bay uh, back through Indianapolis down back to uh, through Kentucky back to Murphy. That's my, my normal route that I do at least once a month. And how, so once a month, is that, would you say how often you're on the road? So every month you're doing this at a consistent pace? Every week or two I'm on the road, but every month ish, I get that big loop in. Okay. Okay. So, so you're, you're the majority of your time. I mean, this is a new thing I've heard from compared to the other stores I've talked to that your primary role these days with the store is doing stuff on the road to help make the business grow. And is Travis on the opposite side of the coin? Is he in the store? Uh, No, no, he's in the warehouse. Um, We have three warehouses in the same city um, that we basically have bulk processed in. Um, But he'll be at the warehouse. He'll either try to facilitate big sales or or big purchases there. Um, He also travels all over the place. Um, Like if we have something in Portland or something like that, he'll fly there and, and make the deal happen and come back. Okay, so you mentioned you have a manager at the store since you both are on the road most of the time. How many employees in total do you guys employ? So right now, just two at the store. Um, but outside of the store, there's only our accountant and one other right now. We At our peak, we had like 12, but right now we only have four. And what is the primary responsibility of, of the employees? Do they all do the 
you know, basic things like helping people get cards, running the events, or do you have specific mm-hmm. roles laid out? Yeah, the managers just make sure that all the buys are correct, um, make sure the ordering is correct, finds new products, um, running events. We, we have, you know, the manager does manager stuff. <laughs> uh, sorry, it could be more specific. Um, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary that you wouldn't consider a regular manager to do. Um, and then we have a teller and they sell cards and make sure everybody stays happy. And these days, what do you find in terms of like the amount of free time that you have with being on the road so often is, do you get your off days or is it, is it mostly you're, you're on 20, like not 24 seven, but for, for the majority of the time. So the benefit of this is I, you know, since I own it, I don't have to be on, but I am, I decided to turn, you know, go out and do stuff as often as possible. Cause if you stop doing things, money doesn't just keep making itself for the most part. I, I had two off days, the last two days, which was nice. I sit at home and play league of legends basically all day. Oh, that's good. So is League of Legends your, your favorite game to play these days? It is It is my go-to as far as computer games, yeah. And do you still play Magic as well? Yeah, I draft. Um, I have a group hug commander deck that I it has a very high power level. It has no win condition. All I do is it, you know, like try to uh, get somebody else to win by turn three is my goal. What's been your favorite set to draft? Oh, boy. Um Saga. <laughs> oh, going back. <laughs> I mean, you, you asked. That's what you get. Um, Fifth Dawn block, whatever block that was. Mirrodin block. Oh, that was wonderful. Mirrodin's actually my favorite set and blo- and that block in general of, of all time. I, I, I was, at the time, I didn't know you could actually draft um, back when I first started playing Magic back then. And so never, never got a chance to draft it, but pretty cool to hear somebody like yourself who's had the chance to do it. What did you like most about it? The competitiveness of my playing at that point was way more fun. Um, I remember that particular draft that I can remember it was it was a seven one flying nim that got plus one plus zero oh for each artifact you have in play, and I attacked with it and I savage beating entwined, so I got to attack two more times. So mm-hmm. I brought somebody from twenty to zero or to negative one with just that one creature. Um, so that was just a fun experience that I recall. So. One fun for them. That's great. <laughs> I'm sure they were very sad they didn't have like a shock or something. Of of course, yeah. No, it's a very very powerful set. I I miss those those older sets. But um, with the magic product today with the store, what are you noticing in terms of sealed? You know, when we look at something like Mirrodin from back in that time to something today, like you get the the Eldrain set. How is sealed product selling these days? So it's incomparable because I wasn't actually that big as far as business when it comes to it back in the day. Um, and then the storefront says it's not necessarily our focus. We couldn't really justify by saying, oh, it's amazing um, because like our, our outlook on it is so, so different looking at the store versus looking at what we do. Um, but I would say it's fine uh, as far as a storefront, but you're, you're not going to you're not going to get rich by by doing your drafts, your weekly drafts, you know. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's fine to draft, but it's that, that part, you need to figure out a way to make that happen, you know, 10,000 times over to, to make more of an effect. What is the better direction to take in terms of trying to bring in as much revenue to a game store as possible? Um, you have to find places that need certain things and then be able to, basically open up the can to, to sell them. So a storefront actually limits your ability. If you're only one person, it limits your ability to make money because you are only one person. You won't be able to travel to go out and find other deals that are bigger unless you're sitting by in a computer and, you know, communicating with as many people as possible, um, which could do it as well. Cause I'm sure there are plenty of people that don't go out and get their collections that haven't just sent to them. Uh, but storefronts are, are hard at certain levels. Are you doing the sales online as well based on these big collections that you're buying? Um, no, um, we're a wholesale to wholesale redistribution company, which basically means I, I buy it for a certain number and I sell it for a little bit more than that, but I buy it and I sell it right away. So what a lot of people do is they buy a collection. Let's say it's a $10,000 collection. Let's say that just for numbers, let's say they paid 50%. Um, so they'll buy it and then they'll put a little bit into the store and some, some will sell there and then they'll send a lot of it 
and you know, they'll have to organize it into their TCG player account, or they'll send it to TCG player because there's a way that you can do that. And then it'll take time to like, eventually you'll get your money back. The way that I do it is like, I'll buy it for, let's say 50% and then I'll sell it for 70% or 75% uh, in person to other people that want it more than I do. And then I make my VIG or the difference immediately. So I could buy a collection for 10,000 tomorrow and sell the next day where somebody using the system where they would use TCG player will just put it into the system and let it ride and eventually they'll get their money. So the, the two models have drastic differences from what I've heard you describe here. When did you realize you wanted to go the route you're going versus the TCG player route? Day one. Yeah, we, we never wanted to go TCG player. We kind of got forced into that situation when we couldn't sell certain things. Or um, they, they provided us with a model where we could send them stuff and then just sit back and watch it instead of like do all the work of shipping it out ourselves. There was a program called SYP. Um, which is no longer, unfortunately, uh, where you could have just sent in the how much ever stuff you had, and then they would process it and sell it or, and put it all on there. All you had to do was price it. Very interesting. So it's a whole different ball game than I would have expected. Your store is definitely doing um, things from a very unique perspective, which I like hearing. I like hearing you know things that aren't you know the norm, and it seems like it's working from a profitable standpoint for you, especially with the the margins. It seems like from what you're describing, you're able to make off that. Yeah, we, we do fine. With the store as, as it's currently constructed, how would you describe the layout of it to somebody like myself that hasn't been to it before? Um, so you walk in and to the left, there's um, D&D books uh, along that row. Um, there's Warhammer. Um, you see the Bill and Ogre's, uh, huge Bill and Ogre's, uh, yellow sign in the front before you go in. Um, there's a standalone, uh, counter so you can go and buy and sell things, uh, with a register, obviously. Um, we have, I think about 10 tables were the space. We had 48 people in there playing all on last Sunday, which was cool. It wasn't any one game. It was a combination of, you know, D and D Warhammer, Magic, um, Lorcana. Um, I'm probably missing something, but those, those are the most parts. Um, we have on the right side, there's the D&D miniatures, all your different characters, uh, almost every one of them on the wall. So probably four to 500 different SKUs. Um, we have five display cases of Magic and Pokemon on each side. Um, we have tons of sealed products. We try not to ever let that run out. So we just find more, um, a couple of the decorations from D and D, uh, like those big busts, the big giant heads, like owl bears and dragons and stuff like that. But, uh, I would call it a quaint little store. What's, what's the most popular game amongst your players that is it, is it commander? Cause I, I hear that so often. Oh yeah, it is at, at this point. Very much so. We tried to, we tried to stick out through the. Um, standard, but there was so much rotation and then COVID and then more rotation and then people just didn't feel like it was uh, a good investment. So we just kind of went towards the direction of Commander. What are your thoughts on the new direction Wizards is taking standard with? Do you think since you that was something you guys were trying to do, do you think what their new direction with it will help you facilitate that? Are you talking about the new booster style or which new direction? I, I don't know. With the with the with trying to you know bring standard back in terms of in store play and you know from a competitive standpoint, they they've been making a push for it recently. Um, they're going to have to try really hard because once once certain people are out, they don't want to have to come back then to just be out again. You know, so I don't know much about the push that they're doing. So I mean, that could probably tell you a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, it seems like. You know, with that, it might not be getting out there as as it seemed from their from their announcement. But that makes sense if you know if people aren't already being drawn to it and doing it at a frequent pace, like you see with Commander these days. Um, that makes sense that it, you know, they may not actually it may not hit the the level of success that they want. But from a competitive standpoint, what types of formats do you see succeeding most at the store? Um, we're very casual friendly um so we we don't really have competitive commander and we have fnm but normally we do drafts so 
right now for us, it's just draft. Um, and I wouldn't even call our drafts really competitive either. Do you hold multiple events like at, at, at going on at the same time? Are you able to do that with your story? Or is it more of like you have it like scheduled each day? Uh, we have schedules. It's open play. You know, anytime anybody wants to come in and play, they're welcome to. Um, but as far as just magic, we don't hold two magic tournaments at the same time. But we do have, we'll have magic going and we'll have D&D somewhere going. And then we'll have Warhammer going at the same time. What type of like numbers in terms of turnout do you see for the various events? So Warhammer, um, on certain days, we can fill up the whole store. Not Warhammer, uh, D&D. So we can have three to four groups going at one time. Uh, which is probably our our biggest like bodies in the store, um, and then sometimes like pre releases for Magic, we'll get twenty to twenty five. Um, like it's not incredible numbers. I used to have my store in St. Louis. We got one hundred and five for a pre release once, but that's a city with millions of people in it versus a town with twenty five hundred. What's been the biggest difference between going from that you've experienced from your time with the store in St. Louis to now and in? in- those different sizes of populations, what has been the biggest like change that you've had to make from a business standpoint in order to, you know, facilitate things? It's unfortunately uncomparable um, because the St. Louis store was ran off of basically nothing. Um, So if I had two boxes on the display case, you know, and I sold two, I could go to my, my rep and buy two more later where at the, at this store, like we've been going at it now for six years and we've grown, the first year we doubled in size, the next year we 50%, the next year we 33% had passed that. And we keep growing by a, a good number every year. Um, so we can stock, like if we order, you know, two or 300 boxes of Pokemon, we can afford to do that and sit on it so I don't have to go back and forth. So efficiencies. Um, if I had the same store in St. Louis, uh, you know, back then with the same kind of financing, I think that I could have done a whole lot better in St. Louis. And when you mentioned earlier about being able to make sure that you always have the necessary sealed product and stock available, and you mentioned that you'll, you know, find it if you don't have it, is is the only option at your disposal the distributors? Oh, no. I mean, you're supposed to always buy your sealed product straight from the distributors, but if if there's secondhand markets, like, at these days, especially, there are people that are, you know, oh, I got too much allocation and I can't sell this, I'll sell it below cost, you know? So there, those opportunities happen. We often buy out stores that have unfortunately, you know, gone under. Um, I believe the summer of COVID, I think we, we bought five stores in two months. What did that process entail when having to buy out a store? Because I'm sure, you know, it's an unfortunate thing to see because I know every from the stores I've talked to and the camaraderie within the industry amongst you all, and I'm sure that has to be quite, you know, a, a bittersweet process. Yeah. I mean, we just keep it business. You know, I I don't really put emotions into it much um, when it comes to that, but I mean, they're happy to have somebody to be able to actually buy everything instead of just, you know, I'll take this good thing. We can actually buy the the old Warhammer that nobody was buying or the old D&D products that, you know, if, if somebody else had came in would have just passed up. So being able to offer them a way to sell everything at one time really helps. And it seems to with going these other avenues to be able to acquire the product as you do, is it something you see typical in the industry in terms of what other stores or from your dealings that you see people doing? Uh, selling product for less than they bought it for or? More or less like acquiring product in different ways because of allocation related to like the distributor side of things. Some, some of the biggest deals I've ever done uh, involve trading. Um, so let's say that I have, you know, a whole bunch of product that I don't need and somebody else has a whole bunch they don't need trading works so well in that, in that Avenue. Um, so that's, that's something that we've done and I've done my whole life. That's, that's interesting. So it's there, there's no actual money that's changing hands in that scenario. It's pretty like I have this product, you have this, we'll just exchange it. Yeah. So like, for instance, right now I have 12 million Magic Bulk. Well, there might be somebody that's like, well, I have too many boxes of this brand new set. Well, why don't we just swap? You know, you could do something with the bulk that I don't plan on doing, and I can sell this at my store, and you have too much. And how have you felt that's worked out from a revenue standpoint in terms of like not having to m- maybe shell out 
as much money from a purchasing standpoint normally? How does that affect you know the, the P and L statement? I guess you could say. I mean, it doesn't technically, but once you get the product that you know you can sell right away, you can then increase cash flow with it by selling it. We're going to take a quick break from this podcast to talk about our sponsor, Cardboard Shuffle. Cardboard Shuffle was our 10th podcast interview here at The Match Slip with store owner Mark. Mark has expanded his brand and has produced his own card sleeves called Shuffle Shields. Shuffle Shields come in packs of 100 premium matte card sleeves for standard size trading cards. They contain no PVC and are acid free. I have 17 packs of Shuffle Shields card sleeves to give away to listeners of the podcast and followers of the Match Slip on social media. Requests for a free pack of card sleeves shipped for free to you will be processed on a first come, first serve basis. To receive your free pack of Shuffle Shields, you'll need to send a screenshot that you're following Cardboard Shuffle on Facebook to Frank at the com. Good luck and back to the episode. In terms of like the events that were held that we were talking about a little earlier, with the news also from the Judge Academy side of things, I'm sure you heard about that. Um, do you have a judge dedicated for your store, like for pre-releases, for example? And does that news with the Judge Academy affect anything of how that, that moves forward? No, we don't. Um, we have some really talented players and myself. We all we kind of know what's going on. Um, if something's ever, you know, really fierce between some players, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll just look it up. Um, the Judge Academy thing, it sucks for the community as a whole when it comes to larger events. And yeah, it'll, it'll be not so good for some of those people that do, but uh, it's not like those judges went away. It's just the Academy isn't being sponsored by wizards anymore. Right. I didn't read up on it. So if you want to give me a little brief rundown of that, that would be awesome. And then I can tell you more. I mean, you, you were correct. I mean, that was, that was essentially it is wizards just isn't backing it anymore. I mean, you still have the, the judges that, you know, were certified for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it's, it's pretty much that, that basic from, from my understanding of it. Yeah. So I, I mean, it's just an organization that went away or funding for that organization. There's going to be something whenever a void happens, somebody finds a way to fill it. So we'll just give it some time and somebody will come up with something creative and either they'll work with it or they won't. If they don't, then something else different will come along. I hope. Of course. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing these days in terms of marketing? Since I've noticed you know, you do some, you take some unique steps for your store that I haven't seen, you know, or heard yet at this point from other stores. What are some of your marketing techniques for um, promoting the store? So the storefront itself, um, we have put very little into as far as marketing, but um, we have a few billboards, the, the pay by the month lift billboards, they're the electronic ones. So you can pay, let's say that we, we budget at $400. So we put $400 in and then periodically all throughout the like 30 or 40 mile radius of where the store is um there there will uh, these messages will pop up on the billboard and it'll be like hey we have laura Connor or hey we we exist and it has returned enough to pay for it uh, almost every time so the first time i remember putting it up a group of like six guys came in and spent almost a thousand dollars Oh, wow. That's a great return on the investment. <laughs> There's another one that I really like to do that I haven't gotten away, like I haven't done yet, but we're going to talk with all of the um, food establishments in, in the area, and we're going to give them these really nice, just cutouts of paper that say, draw your favorite Pokemon on them. And then on the back, it'll say, this is a quest to bring it to Bill and Ogres and get a free booster pack. So you know, use your Facebook to market the place where you're, you're putting these things. And then you help, you know, hope that they do the same thing for you. Um, and then we give away a free booster pack. So it's a, a, essentially a cost of like $2 and 25 cents. And that will hopefully get the person to come in from the establishment they were to us. Then we also have a custom piece of art that they already made that we are going to take and stick in the wall. So they get promoted. Um, and then they find out that we exist. Um, but hopefully in, you know, a few months when, when we talk again, uh, at one point, maybe, um, I will give you the results of this, <laughs> but I think it'll work very well. I, I would definitely love to hear it. You get so much out of it. You get interaction with the customer because, so they've put time in already by drawing you something. Then they have their own quest. So they go out of their way to come to you. Uh, now they're there, they get a prize and now they're there. They feel like 
hmm, maybe I should look around and possibly buy something or come here and play. How did this idea all manifest? I, I really like it. I think it's a very good one. Um, I don't know, but I think of them all the time. <laughs> That's oh, so, so coming up with ideas, unique ones, it is, it's just, would you say it's something that just comes easy for you? It is, it is one of my favorite things. Yes. What is a future plan that you have for the store looking towards the future? So I want to, we're actually talking about this a lot. Um, the, the ways that it can improve are more, having more of a dice selection. Mine's kind of weak. And then I always just want more. Um, we're going to put in more shelves around the top layer. So the six, about a six and a half foot shelf so that we can put more big items up there that don't uh, really move as much, but you still want them on display um, are available. Um, this allows us to take more rack room and put a lot more space. Like the storefront's only 1,500 square feet right now. Um, there needs to be, or we're currently closed Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, I'm looking to get another employee so that we can, you know, sit, open Mondays and Tuesdays without stress on the other two employees. Once that happens, like historically, those are the worst days. Um, but I want to integrate uh, like a whatnot stream, which is a live auction streaming platform um, and get some of my employees a, uh, basically used to doing that. And if they do it well, like, you know, it could increase revenue. Whenever I was on whatnot selling, I could do a couple thousand dollars easily in a few hours. So even if they do $1,000 a night throughout the six hours they're there, it's just that much more to the bottom line. And why do you think whatnot is something that's working so well in the, in the card space? People like to be entertained. So whatnot isn't necessarily only a sales platform. It's an entertainment platform. Have you watched much of it? So I've seen really just like the ads for it and people promoting it. I haven't used it myself, but I've heard people describe it. Like the professor from Tularean Community College <laughs> described it as, what was it? eBay meets, and then Twitch had a baby. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, but it's it's fairly competitive. So if you go in, there are people playing uh, like there are people playing games on it to sell stuff. Like one of my friends uh, has a, a platform on there, and he uses experience. Uh, so when you go in, you get an experience uh, for every minute or so you're in his group, and like you level up throughout it. So it it's advantageous for you to go to his chat so you get experience because sometimes that might do something for you. Where other people's chats are like, here's a card, here's another card, you know, and it's just bland. Um, but it's really actually kind of exciting. It's it's I think they're doing a lot of this style of sales in uh, China, I believe. Is this something, since you would like to have an employee that would do it, is this something you would consider doing yourself in the meantime? Um, I have. It doesn't make enough money for me to spend the time on it yet, um, for, for me to just dedicate my time to it. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it, it takes a lot of energy to, to do. For instance, like I have done this before, and I could only go for like three or four hours before I was completely drained of my energy. So we've made a decision for me to use that energy in thinking of either ideas or finding other big giant collections or selling big giant piles of stuff. That's understandable. And is that, that's your ultimately your primary role with the store these days is going out and buying collections and being on the road. Right. And you mentioned that Mondays and Tuesdays are the worst days in the gaming industry. Not necessarily the whole industry. It's, it's, it's definitely... Go ahead. Tell me the rest of your sentence. Sorry. Okay. No, no, no. No worries. I, I realize I actually phrased it wrong. I meant like in the game store side of things that Mondays and Tuesdays are worse. I, I forget the store who told me this, but I was told pretty much the same thing that Mondays aren't and Tuesdays aren't the greatest. So I think that that naturally that is maybe is the case. I think if you went out of your way to make them better, you could. It's just a a little bit of a mindset thing and a little bit of just how it is. What would you say is the, the obstacle with it? Like from whether it be from your own experience or your personal opinion that you think could be done better to make it that not potentially be the case. So let's look at why is it that way first? So the people are, you know, they, they spend a lot of time on the weekends doing as much as they can. And then on Monday they want to just relax. That's what I see it as being, but also 
going to a game store and casually playing something not necessarily competitive could be your relaxed time going and playing a little D and D or, or hang out and playing magic with, with, you know, your, you know, maybe, maybe uh, competitive CEDH is your thing. So that, that could still just be that way. But uh, we had, we like to use the play on words. We had like uh, modern Monday uh, where we try to get everybody to play modern and we got like eight to 10 people constantly when we were open on Monday. Um, but I think if you just talk to people and develop that, it might also be in the person who's, um, who's trying to put it out there, you know, like me on Monday, for instance, when I come home from a show that I work three 17 hour days, and then I had to drive across the country to get home on Monday, I don't want to do anything. So is it really the, is it the customer? Is it the, the store employee or store owner that doesn't want to actually do too much more? I don't know. How did you build up the the endurance for doing shows of that long, like those 17-hour days? Because I, I was kind of flabbergasted when I went to you know my first three-day convention. I've been to conventions before, but not three-day ones, and got to talk with some of the store owners there. And you know, they're on their feet, you know, like you said, that length of time, 15, 16 hours a day. How do you build up the stamina for that? Because that obviously can be draining. When you put out $10,000 just to sit down before even buying a single card, you got to make that money back. Yeah. You, you do. <laughs> That's a little bit of a driving force. Um, so going to these shows, it just at, at one of your normal, regular, medium, medium to large size booths at magic shows, for the most part, are around $10,000 just to, just to set up, not including getting your entire staff and all of your stuff there, you know, um, and it's, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta be in the right mindset to, to really, you know, buy as much stuff or sell as much stuff as you can to, to make that up and then make more on top of it, which is what your, your whole plan is. But as far as endurance, like today, I can't do it. <laughs> um, I've kind of developed myself into a different kind of position, so I don't have to do the shows. I actually did one called Lotus Con a, a few weeks ago and it was only a two day show. And it, it beat my ass. I don't I, like, I was very exhausted after it, but the guys that sit by in there and buy cards for 16, 17 hours, like their minds are numb by the end of the day. I, I can imagine it. It seems something that could be mentally draining, but like you mentioned, when you're paying $10,000 for the booth for, you know, the average size convention, it, it's definitely the motivating factor to, to push through it. Just to, you know, to, for the hope of breaking even is what it's o always seems to be the goal from what I hear is the breaking even. You want to be profitable, but if you could break even, get the marketing exposure from it, that seems to be a positive. Yeah, it's it's weird, though. Um, I've, I've never only wanted to break even. I've always, I, my, my goals were always to make money. Um, like, so I, I don't know. Marketing in magic is very hard because the dollar is your market. Um. I, a friend of mine, he, he did a campaign where he sent out all the different things to try to get direct website sales. And he spent months in shirts and uh, he promoted different uh, different groups of people to go to different conventions. And they were winning and doing very well. Um, and he saw about a 1% increase in the sales from his direct sale site over over like TCG Player and, and Amazon. And how is that from a vantage viewpoint of of the industry in terms of making that profit how is that viewed that that one percent so he got a one percent growth it, like it was it went from two to three so i guess it was like 50 percent growth total but it went from two percent of his sales were going through his direct website to three percent were going through his direct website Oh, okay. Yeah, that that's definitely a good thing because I'm I was I was curious if it was just a one percent growth and if that was considered good. But that no, going what you described, no, that sounds very good, especially with not having to pay like the commission fee that you know selling online through TCG Player would. Unfortunately, the one percent, like even even though it was fifty percent because it went from two to three, it was nothing compared to the output of the costs of all of the things that he was trying to, to actually do. Um, I, I wouldn't consider it. I mean, yes, you, you can look at it like 50% and that's good. But when it comes to it, like he was, he was aiming to get to like 15 or 20%. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was getting at is basically magic players are very smart. So they're just going to buy the cheapest thing. It's the same thing from anybody who's selling it. 
Um, some people are smart and have money, so they value their time, so they're not going to make a giant list, and they're just going to buy it all from one website, which is fine too. But for the most part, people are are cash savvy and, and smart, so people just race to the bottom, and people buy at the bottom. You know, you know, there's no point in buying a thousand dollar card when somebody else has it for eight fifty. I was going to say, is there anything unique that you do from your standpoint to counteract that? I guess since you know, everybody is kind of racing to the bottom in that regard. And, you know, you need to make a profit on your end to keep the business running. Like what, what's the balance there? Um, they're completionists, uh, when it comes to some of the, some of the things. So they want to have every card in stock. Uh, If you want to have every card in stock, you can't sell, you can't actually be at the bottom. Um, and sometimes those cards sell as well to individuals that are only buying from that store or for any other of many purposes, but I sell to any company that can give me what I'm asking for, basically. And if you're racing to the bottom, you might not be able to buy my card. If you're selling, let's say the guy selling it for eight fifty, and there's another guy selling it for 11. Well, the guy at 11 can offer me $8 for the card and still make a little bit of money, but the guy at eight fifty can't. So I sell my cards across the board to the people who can pay me what I want, which is around there. Day one, our company was already established um, because of me and Travis's history and work history from everything for the past 20 years. Um, so when we opened the store, the store was only opened by one of our employees who wanted there to be a store. So it was a pet project. Uh, but now it does well enough to where I have to actually keep it going because it's making money, which is great, which is not normal. So my final question here. So if, if money you know, wasn't a barrier for something that you wanted to do. You know, we did talk about, you know, your future plans for the store. What is a lofty goal that you would like to see maybe come to fruition one day? Maybe it's not, you know, in the cards right now, but it's something that you would like for the store in the future. So I want to kind of break off the D&D portion of the store and make a truly unique D&D experience um, where when you walk into the store, you see every single thing you could possibly imagine that's ever been released from Dungeons and Dragons. And then to the right side of the store for most of it, right? And to the left side, you see everything you would, you can see and everything that you could buy inside the original player's handbook, not the first one, but like 5.0, um, where it has all the different random stuff. And then all of that stuff, there'll be three different kind of like layers. There'll be like, you can buy a sword for $10, you can buy a sword for $50, or you can buy a sword for 500 So each one of those two or 300 different items has three different levels. So anybody can walk in and buy something that they think is neat. Um, and then on the other side, there's everything for D&D, and then there's tables to play, and like it's very uh, customed. So like you walk in and you, you, you look like you're walking in an old tavern, an old item store. Very cool. And what do you think would need to occur in order to see that come to fruition? Uh, I think if we got paid all the money that we were owed from everybody, um, we we could be able to do that pretty easy. (laughs) Well, I hope that happens for you so that you can make this uh, dream come to to reality. This episode of The Match Slip is sponsored by Crash CityCon, Roanoke, Virginia's premier gaming and fan convention. It's tabletop gaming at its best in addition to role-playing games, board games, There are vendors and so much more. Play with some of the top game masters in the area, enjoy a casual game in their open gaming area, or learn to play games you always wanted to play. Attend Crash City Con August 23rd through the 25th of 2024 at the Berglund Center Special Events Center. You could check out more information at CrashCityCon.com. As we wrap up here, Ogre, I appreciate you coming on the show today. Where can people find your store online um, so they can connect with the store and buy stuff from you if, uh, if they feel so inclined. Yeah. Bill and ogres games.com. Um, we have a spot to buy and sell things. Um, you can sell stuff like bulk magic, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon. Um, not magic right now, but maybe later. And we sell different various stuff on there. Otherwise just come in, in person to the store in Murphy, North Carolina and say, hi. Um, you could also add me on Facebook. It's just, uh, Matthew ogre Stevens on there. And yeah. Awesome. I'll be sure to include the link uh, in the show notes so people can connect with you as well there. And uh, I appreciate you coming on the show today, Ogre. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. 
And for everybody else listening, if you'd like to join our newsletter where I share my personal reviews of the stores I visit in person, uh, feel free to do so at thematchlip.com newsletter, and we will talk to you all in the next episode. Take care.